Hi everyone, my name is Bart Farrell and Amanda will be joining us today but in a different way because Amanda Brock unfortunately got COVID and isn't able, wasn't able to come to the event. Luckily, Amanda and I uh, had recorded a podcast earlier this year, so I'll be kind of going back and forth, or as if we're kind of doing flashbacks. But um, <laughs> this could, nothing could really be more ADHD than this, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, as Amanda put in the description of the talk, there will be no slides, and that is 100% accurate. But before we get started, um, just want to get a quick feel of the crowd. If you feel comfortable saying this, it's okay, and if you don't, that's totally fine. If you have ADHD, raise your hand. Okay, good, we've got some folks. If you have a family member or friend who has ADHD, raise your hand, cool. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, it's just nice to know a little bit of background of where everybody's at. There are many roads uh, to take in this, in this sort of process when talking about this topic. Um, but to stay true to what Amanda had put in the description, you know, talking about the power of diagnosis, you know, everyone goes through a, di a different diagnosis process um, at a different phase in their lives, all right? I'm 37 years old. I guess I should intro a little bit better. My name is Bart Farrell. <laughs> I'm originally from the U.S., but I've been living here in Bilbao, actually, for the last 12 years. And I got diagnosed with ADHD last year in, I believe, February or March. Um, and it's been a very interesting process since then. I would say there are many processes that uh, are ongoing. And, and like, we'll, we'll hear a little bit from Amanda about, about her process, because like I said, no two processes really seem to be the same. Talking about adult diagnosis as opposed to being diagnosed as a child, the different sources of stigma that can, uh, that can go into that, and the fact that ADHD is something that's being seen more and more, all right? Um, I met Amanda previously through Open UK, and we connected a lot more once we realized that both of us uh, had ADHD. In Amanda's case, it's even it's different as well because she is also diagnosed uh, as being on the autism spectrum. Um, so that's a, an additional factor that, that makes her case a little bit different. Um, but what I've realized throughout all of this, and if there was any mistake, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but anything that in the same way with open source, if you make community part of your solution, things probably get a lot easier. In my case with ADHD, the best thing that I've done uh, by far has been talking to other people with ADHD and getting informed in, in that way because of realizing other people go through similar things. Sometimes they're still different. There are many different flavors we can say of ADHD or in terms of how it manifests itself. Um, but specifically to the point today about speaking about diagnosis, I think it's, I think it's fair we can just jump right in um, to what, uh, how Amanda was approaching this um, in the interview. And I would highly recommend focusing on Amanda's side of the screen, because if you look at my side of the screen, you'll see that I'm probably looking at 500 different tabs and getting quite distracted. <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, wasn't mean I wasn't listening. So let's start out with, uh, to hear from directly from Amanda. I might need a little bit of help on the sound um, to get that uh, optimized, but I think we should be good to go. Oh, it's quite a long story. So um, I was looking at autism. Sorry, but can we get a little bit more volume, if possible, just to make sure everyone can hear? And people kept joking. Oh, let's back it up a little bit just to make sure. A whole process story. Oh, it's quite a long story. So um, I was looking at autism and people kept joking me, saying to me how aspy I was. So I thought I would get an autism review done as part of a process within Open UK of some work we wanted to do to support neurodiverse people. And I went into a process of uh, assessing my neurodiversity without having given it any thought. So about two and a half years ago, I had an autism and ASD diagnosis. And I was just furious when I got it. Didn't deal with it for a good six months, wouldn't look at it. I hadn't considered that I would have an emotional reaction. But the autism piece was harder to do. And I think women we mask really well, so it's quite a, a difficult process to work out if you are ASD or not. But the ADHD piece, everybody I came into contact with kept saying, you must go and get yourself assessed. And I kept saying, no, I'm not going to because I don't want to be medicated. And what can they do for me other than medicate me? So it took me a couple of years to actually be willing to go and get assessed. And that largely happened because an old university friend of mine who is a very smart PhD, mother of many children, um, said to me that she'd taken medication and it was life-changing. So I thought, okay, you know, if someone I know that well and I really trust their opinion is telling me that, then I'm gonna go and have a look at this. And 
I went to the NHS and diagnosis here takes multiple years. So I paid something that I couldn't really afford to have a private diagnosis done. And I've had that for 11 months and I'm going to be 54 in August. So I was just about, I was probably 52 and a bit when I had my diagnosis. Okay. Um, with that okay. in mind, a few things. We can, we can stop there real quick. So just to unpack some of the things that Amanda was mentioning, all right? In terms of the diagnosis process, like I said, it's very different in every case, right? In her case, she was going through uh, an autism spectrum, taking a look at that, and then this sort of just kind of came up. What I wanna mention here is, once again, my name is Bart Farrell and I'm a freelance content creator. I am a, not a mental health professional, so I can only speak from my experience, right? I'm not telling you that this is what has to be done. I can only say what I did, all right? In my case, uh, during the pandemic, did anybody have a difficult time in the pandemic? Yeah, <laughs> I definitely did. In Spain, it was really rough. We were locked in for like three months and we could only go to the supermarket, um, to the pharmacy, and we had a really strict curfew and you couldn't go outside to do sports. And I was having a really, really hard time. And it seems like it's been from other conversations with other folks that the pandemic was something that sort of brought the ADHD to a head. And so at that time, I started seeing uh, a psychologist who I had seen when I was in, in university. And she said, you know what? It may be the case that you may have ADHD based on the things that you're talking about, all right? The difficulty concentrating, uh, mood swings, another thing that's uh, part of ADHD, which I would say is one of the hardest things in my particular case is what's called RSD, which is rejection sensitive, uh, sensitivity dysphoria, where it's the, the immense reaction to being rejected or the feeling that you're being rejected or anticipating that you're going to be rejected. So like I said, this sort of emotional um, dysregulation was something that definitely came up in my case. Something else that I wanna mention that, uh, that Amanda touched on, because this is in a series of conversations that I've done called ADH Me, ADH We, which I started after um, doing a panel in KubeCon in Detroit with some wonderful folks and realized, you know what? I think there are other conversations that can be had here. And if it makes a difference for one person, and even that one person's me, well, I'm sure I'm very happy to do this. So Amanda mentioned something about, you know, getting, getting assessments, all right? They're different in every country. Uh, I'm not gonna survey about how many different countries are represented here, but it's vastly different in Spain than how it's dealt with elsewhere, all right? Um, I'm originally from the US. When I was thinking about getting uh, assessed, I looked at options as well in the United States, but then it was like, if I'm gonna get treatment in Spain, how's that gonna work out? Um, different factors that go into that, all right? In, the, in this particular case, Amanda, you know, um, got private, you know, private consultation. Prior to getting diagnosed, I did several online tests I wanna make a huge disclaimer here. There was a report from the BBC about how there were like sort of not legitimate diag uh, diagnoses um, uh, d that were going on through practitioners that weren't really asking the right questions. ADHD is not something that can be diagnosed in 30 minutes, right? It takes lengthy conversations. I had a full assessment with a psychologist as well as a psychiatrist. I had to do a really boring, horrible logic test with shapes and, th and things like that that I, I absolutely hated. Uh, so I, I'm gonna say in, in my case, I felt like it was, it was quite a thorough process. So be, you know, just, just keep that in mind, all right? Just cause you go to one place and it says, hey, take our free assessment. And the online assessments that I did, all of them came, showed that uh, I had ADHD. And there was one that was so long, I was like, I'm not even gonna bother doing this, which I think was a further indication. Um, and so yeah, I mean, for a full disclaimer, I can't, make, I can't put together Ikea furniture, right? Like I get, reading instructions is not really my thing. Um, but like I said, it really is different everywhere you are in the world. So it's best to get informed if that's something or someone you care about is interested in, it's best to get informed regarding local laws, local medical care and things of that nature. One of the things that Amanda mentions as well that she'll mention again in, in a further answer is the difference in diagnosis because of being a woman, right? There's a huge amount of stigma around this, right? And there's an additional amount of masking, which is a topic that you'll see a lot of neurodiverse to, uh, folks talking about that that in terms of social situations as you know, you have to control impulses, you can't say just what you think or how, and you have to anticipate how people might take a reaction, things of that nature. But in addition, being a woman adds a whole nother level of complexity in many cases, right? Traditionally speaking, ADHD is considered to be something that affects young boys who are jittery, who can't sit still, um, associations with not doing well in school. You find some cases like that, you find other, for me, school is relatively easy. I didn't have major problems. I did have other things though, unpacking, looking at emotional dysregulation, this rejection sensitivity dysphoria, different things that were very much a part of my life as, as a child, as an adolescent and a young adult. But like I said, 
Um, different cases um, can be different. Another thing that Amanda talked about later in this conversation, and I do highly recommend checking it out. Um, happy to post the link on Twitter um, afterwards because it's it's we don't have enough time to, to get it, dig into everything today. But the aspect of medication is anybody here from the United States? Just out of curiosity, yeah. Big problems right now getting access to meds in the United States. Big big problems, right? Uh, ADHD meds have been put in a category of being at risk. There's new legislation to control things, not only on opioids, but also on stimulants. And ADHD medications have been affected by that. So there is a shortage going on. In the UK, they've also been suffering from a similar problem. And Amanda talked about that more in, in the interview. And Amanda actually mentioned in the podcast that she had been for several months without having access to medication, all right? The point that I'm making here is that in any diagnosis process, medication can be part of the conversation, but it doesn't have to be the only part of the conversation. There are other forms of complementary treatments that can be beneficial, um, such as cognitive behavioral, ther behavioral therapy. There can be other things as well too of establishing routines. There are lots of different elements out there. So don't feel like going into an ADHD diagnosis process means you're going to be, it's, you're just gonna be medicated because that was a, a sort of, prejudice, I would say, or bias or assumption I had going into it and then realized this is part of a, a bigger conversation, all right? I just want to say this because I suffered a lot feeling isolated when I was going through the diagnosis process, feeling the stigma, embarrassed, not wanting to talk about it, which is something we'll see a little bit later. Um, but just remember that it's a process and I can't recommend enough the, the fact of take advantage of uh, communities of folks with ADHD. It's interesting that Amanda's in the UK because one of the best resources that I found is called the Adult uh, ADHD UK Podcast. And it's basically two uh, neuroscientists insulting each other for 30 minutes, right? And so and they, they're, they're, uh, they're very, very funny. Um, and it's a kind of humor that I like. It doesn't mean that it's for everybody. But like I said, go out there and find the resources that are gonna work for you but really listening to people firsthand from what their experiences have been like, I find has been um, the, most, the most helpful aspect, all right? So now let's keep it moving. Let's get back to Amanda. I'm sure we're just interrupting each other the whole time here. That's another very strong ADHD characteristic. Looks like Amanda's about to talk. I about kind of just got there as well, and we can talk more about that. It's yeah, time. so yeah, but, uh, but I guess taking a few steps back is that you know, you mentioned, you know, having a friend and, and that making a big difference. And I think in a lot of people's cases that that influences it. But what were some of the things that made you feel like, okay, based on what I understand ADHD to be, once you started looking into it, what are the things that you identified with, particularly as an adult, because the stereotype of ADHD, oh, it's, you know, jittery children that can't stop fidgeting and, and, and things like that. But in the case of adults, what were things that you noticed? You're like, maybe there is something here. Absolutely nothing. And I had no sense whatsoever that I was ADHD. And it was only when medical professionals kept telling me that I should go and have a diagnosis done that I was very clearly ADHD that I, I thought it was a bit rude of them to start with, to be quite honest. I wasn't exactly pleased about it. And I had no idea of how ADHD really manifests. So in my head, it's those naughty children running around screaming in a classroom at school, underachievers. And it hadn't occurred to me what it really was. And as I started to think about it, I started to talk to friends. I found more and more people I knew identified as being ADHD, mostly undiagnosed because it's a very expensive process and it's very difficult to get it in the public health care of the NHS. Um, what I have since realized is the behaviors that I have. I, people won't expect this of someone like me, which I think is why it's good to talk about it but it is more than possible that there is a single task that I have to achieve in a day that could be worth money to me or my organization that's critical or necessary for my reputation or really just important in life. And I will completely forget I have to do that. It's just outrageously bad. I come across as being a bit dippy by not doing things or being disorganized, yet I do so much and I achieve so much. I'm super organized. But there are certain things I can't do. Like I'm really bad at paying parking tickets. I, I take the, I, things like that kind of admin. Sometimes I carry it to multiple countries over multiple weeks and months before I can actually make myself do it. And then when I do that kind of admin, it takes me half an hour to do five things. And I've probably incurred fines of several hundred pounds because I've not just been able, you know, another friend calls it the ADHD tax. 
So I'm really bad at those kind of things. I can't force myself to do things if I've got it into my head that that's not, you know, high in my priorities or it's dull. It's, you know, not a now thing. It's not what I'm currently interested in. I'm really bad at applying myself. I find it much easier to work in a sort of free environment like the, the one I have at Open UK than to be in a prescriptive environment. Uh, I was a lawyer for 25 years. Uh, I've had a couple of bosses punish me by making me de be desk-based, knowing that I can't do that. I can't sit in one place for a whole day. I've enjoyed working internationally because that involves moving around, you know, and it's not, if you move me around anywhere, I just cannot sit in the same place day after day. On the other hand, I have like this super focus that when I'm on it, I'm on it and I forget about everything else. I interrupt people, which I've been really, really pushed over the years about at work. And as a young female lawyer in a very sexist environment and time, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, I was really punished for doing that to older men. Um, I, I, I honestly, I'm listening, but I cannot show people I'm listening. I could repeat back what you've just said, but I cannot demonstrate to people in a way that makes them comfortable that I'm listening to them. So, okay, good. So a couple other things to, to take note of, right? So one of the things that she mentioned is, you know, having the difficulty, and this is something that I saw a tweet about recently saying, no, no, ADHD people are, it's not a deficit of attention, it's paying attention to everything at the same time, all right? And sometimes the feeling of try, I, perfect example. So. This week that I have this week, I did a full day event yesterday with the Soda Foundation. I'm giving two talks today. After this talk, I'm going down getting my suitcase, going to the airport because I'm emceeing another event tomorrow in Holland. And then I come back on Thursday to the CNCF meetup that you are all invited to. All right. So this is very typical overboarding. And there's a great video that came out recently from Casey Neistat, who's an American video maker. And he talks about ADHD as being this creative poison that you go into modes of either very low stimulation and stagnation and feeling bored, which then piles up with procrastination and then leads to extreme amount, because it's normal to have a certain amount of stress as a source of stimulation, but when it gets too much, then it starts breaking into anxiety or a lot of more mistakes are gonna happen. So these last two weeks building up to this one have been quite difficult, but as I stand here today, I'm doing quite well. Um, but what I wanna touch on more with what Amanda said is that her coming across as being really dippy, all right? My entire life, I've been told about how good I am at academics, how well I can do things, how I can put things together, that I'm energetic and passionate, but the very little things, like what Amanda said about paying a parking ticket that I'm not capable of doing, are so crushingly embarrassing. Um, like, for example, or just disaster scenarios. Like, my phone right now, is on its last, last, last legs. It says that there's moisture in the charger, and that's not true because I've dried it out with a blow dryer and I've cleaned it out, and it still keeps saying that. And rather than just going and buying a new phone, I keep walking around with this piece of shit in my pocket that's causing me all these problems, and it's really important for work, all right? And particularly at a conference time. At this event I'm going to tomorrow in the Netherlands, they ask, can you take a picture with all the, with all the, with all the speakers? The problem is this thing taking selfies is pretty much out of storage. It's really interesting that I organized a storage conference yesterday too. Um, but, uh, but these things are kind of crippling where you have to say like, well, you know what, maybe I won't be able to take a picture because my phone might die and the camera doesn't work. Anyway, so like I said, these just really basic things that just pile up and something that a neurotypical person would be like, oh, phone doesn't work. Go get a new one. Solve the problem. In my mind, it's like, no, life will be much more exciting if, if this impending doom and chaos from all sides. So like I said, I very much identify with what Amanda says there about some of these just basic admin tasks. In my case, I have the blessed fortune to work with someone who's very organized and knows about this. My point here, it just in the same way that, as, as Amanda mentioned, getting that, you know, that treatment, that diagnosis, and every country is going to be different. One thing, that, and being open about having ADHD is different in every country, the, how it's going to be received. So if you have ADHD or if you're getting diagnosed, you get to decide who you want to talk about it with and who you don't want to talk about it with. It's your business, right? Some people will say stupid stuff. There will be things, there will be reactions where, oh, so you're crazy? Oh, does that mean you're schizophrenic? Or all the whole litany of other things that based on people's misunderstandings, lack of contact, or they haven't talked to people, it's not their fault, all right? But these things can, can be very damaging. And so like I said, you have to decide about how you're going to approach it. But what I do think is important and what I try to do is that I try to explain, look, uh, I can tell you that I have ADHD and it might mean this or that. 
Instead, what I try to say is I may need reminders. I will also try to be very upfront about the things that I'm not good at doing, yet sometimes, of course, I still have to do admin tasks. I try to delegate as many as possible, or I also try to inform people to control expectations about if you ask me, putting things in a spreadsheet, I would rather pull my toenails off, all right? That's just not something I'm gonna be good at. And I've organized database conferences, all right? But it's just not something I'm good at, nor, nor I think I'm ever gonna be good at. So like I said, it's, it's just really important about being honest and being transparent and not being super hard on yourself. If I could give any piece of advice, don't do that, because I've done that way too much. And it's something that takes time, all right? It's easy to be, for me, it's really easy to be kind and generous to other people, but to apply that same kindness and generosity to myself is something that has, has taken me a lot of time, all right? And if, if there's anything that's come up as a common thread in the conversations that I've had with people with ADHD is that you have to build, no matter what medication you're taking, no matter what therapist you're talking to, build self-kindness in whatever way you can into your daily life. And also, if you don't have ADHD, it's just a good thing to do. Life is short, why make it harder? Um, so like I said, there, there, are, there are different things to keep in there. Um, another thing that Amanda mentioned too about the transparency in the work environment, right? I'm a freelancer and Amanda is too. Both of us like to be in environments where we can do different things that perhaps in a regular company you wouldn't find just in one job. Um, I like recording videos. I also like organizing events, but I wouldn't want to only organize events or only record videos or do things in English and also do things in Spanish. So I really enjoy being a freelancer because it allows me to work on those different aspects, all right? Which is why I've been offered jobs before and for different reasons I'll say, I don't think I'm the right person for this because I thrive in environments where I can be switching from different things. Something that's a skill that some, some folks with ADHD will talk about is the ability to jump from one subject to, an, to the next. Whereas for a neurotypical person, they might be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need more context. When you get a bunch of ADHD people together, you start like frogs on lily pads of, we're talking about pens, and then we talk the pen is mightier than the sword. If you had to get a sword, what kind would it be? Do you like Japanese samurai movies? No, I prefer the sword from Braveheart. Anyway, all these things, like the tangents are just natural and it feels okay, but we have to understand that we live in a world where not everybody thinks that way, and that's not their fault, and that's okay too, all right? So just anticipating those things and, and providing proper uh, context, but I really echo what Amanda says of having being punished in work environments, you know, for and being put in a desk-based situation because of someone that's not going to do very well with that, all right? And, and, and also as well, too, talking about being in a very, very sexist world where being defiant and things like that or interrupting people, in, in her particular case, being pushed a lot to correct those behaviors, wanting to correct them, and sometimes just not having the, the mechanisms to do so, all right? Um, good. So we can skip my part and move on to Amanda's next point. Whoop. There we go. In different areas, but you know, admin tasks were not researched a bit more. Like, Go. what are some things that you want to focus on there? So, I do challenge authority, and I am, I don't know, defiance the right word, but this has always been something that's been quite difficult for me. And over the years, uh, I don't know if it's an appropriate thing to say, but it's the truth. Many women have taken me aside and told me how to play men the way women do, and that I should be doing that rather than being so direct. And I, you know, I'm direct to Dutch bluntness. And I loved living in the Netherlands because of it, because it was easy. And in Scotland, it was much easier than it has been in England because we're a more direct culture. So I come from a culture that is quite direct to start with, but I, and I don't ever mean to be rude, but particularly in writing. So email hasn't necessarily been good for me as that's evolved and messaging, because I'll just say the words that I need to. If I have time, I've learned to write a nicety around it but that's time. And when I run out of time or when I'm under pressure, you just get the very blunt X, Y, Z. And, you know, it, I guess we're all quite rule-based. And that's something that I suppose has come through as well, you know, in the directness over time. So it's not been easy, but I didn't know why it wasn't easy through a career in big corporates in something like legal. Probably entirely the wrong thing for me to have done but nobody really understood those kind of personality types and traits. And I think in many ways it stopped me flourishing much earlier than I could have. Yeah. Good. So one thing that she mentioned here as well about flourishing earlier, the sense of regret for a lot of folks when they get diagnosed with ADHD, like I said, the diagnosis is not the end, it's the start, right? And there, there's so many different processes happening on different levels. 
Now, one of the things that I realize and, and have gone through is this sort of mourning process of realizing, oh, I was going through all these things perhaps unnecessarily for a long time. And there are a lot of things as well, too, because like I said, ADHD, there is the part about attention, but there's also a big part about being impulsive. Um, and there's a really strong emotional component that in my case, I would say have been as strong, if not stronger, or the parts that I, I don't really care so much about not paying attention, but having these, this emotional roller coaster and being impulsive and, and, and struggling with a lot of things. And it's actually interesting if, to look at the case of in Spain, how ADHD first started getting studied in adults was in the 1970s in a drug rehab clinic where they realized, wait a minute, these people, it's not just a substance use disorder. The problem here is uh, controlling impulses, right? And a dopamine deficit, right? That's another category that comes up a lot in ADHD conversations is that when someone accomplishes something in a neurotypical brain, there's a sense of satisfaction and relief. For folks with ADHD that don't get that, it means risky behaviors. It means, once again, substance use and substance abuse. That can also be channeled into entrepreneurial activities, right? There seems to be somewhat of a correlation with folks that are entrepreneurs and that also have ADHD because they have very high energy levels, they're very passionate, they are interested in starting things, in maintaining them, that's another conversation. Um, so, I really like starting things, I'm not gonna lie, maintaining them, but it's hard, but like I said, you just have to anticipate that. And so I know it's like, okay, you know, something I've learned, you know, from, from working in, so in software companies is, what's the definition of done? right? Because the definition of starting is, oh, this is sexy, this is fun, fireworks, all this stuff, and then it's like done, so it's dry, it's boring, it's paperwork. But it also means build teams that compensate for those different skills. That's another thing that, that, that I've learned through this process. But like I said, with Amanda getting her diagnosis, you know, at, uh, at the, at, at over, you know, age 50, and in my case as well, getting diagnosed at the age of 36, this big unpacking process of who am I, identity issues, where does one thing start? Where does another finish? These are all normal questions to ask and there doesn't have to be a really clear answer. I go back to what I said previously. You've gotta build in those elements of self-kindness to make those conversations easier for you so they don't become so overwhelming, all right? No matter what path you take, whether it's with medication, whether it's without, many different ways to do this. Because I also wanna say this, if people think that medication is just, oh, guaranteed 180 degree change, no. All right, don't think that, all right? Don't hurt yourself with that misinformation. That's not the case. In my case, I was originally really scared about this idea about being medicated, because I was like, I don't want to do that. That's going to make me a zombie, or that's, I'm not interested in doing that. Heard lots of bad things. The pharmaceutical industry, they're trustworthy. Um, but, but like I said, it was something I was like, well, I think I need to be willing to try this. You, before taking any medication, whether it's for ADHD or anything else, read about it, read case studies, read the side effects, see what other people have gone through so you know what to anticipate. You have to give it a chance. I first started out on um, one, I can say the name in Spanish, I don't remember the name in English, but it was sort of like the generic sort of cheaper option and it was okay for a while, but then it built up to the point where I f felt like more energetic than necessary. Didn't help that I'm a heavy coffee drinker and those things don't go well together. Um, so I was like, I have to give up coffee to take this. Can I do both at the same time? Anyway, brilliant. So realize that it might be time to, to try something else, right? So like I said, it's don't expect to get everything right on the first try. Be kind to yourself because this is a process and it's going to take time, right? So there's no need to punish yourself. There's no need to be extra hard on yourself for something that, that already brings along its own, its own challenges, okay? Good. Um, we can keep going. I need to skip to 1107 because I've got my how do you yeah i've thought a lot about this um i'm really good at building relationships and i always have been and i suspect my father who has passed away so i haven't been able to talk to about this i suspect he was the same and i actually think i spent a lot of time with him as a very little girl and i think he taught me behavior that was a survival mechanism you know how to manage and navigate people long before most people have to learn those skills because for somebody who is neurodiverse to to manage and to fit they have to have those and I think he taught me very well and actually it's ended up being a superpower because I am so good at managing lots of different stakeholders because I've had to do that to survive in a room from probably not much long, much later rather than I learned to talk. 
you know, three, four years old, I was probably having to navigate and manage the people around me so that I could fit. Right. So in, de in developing those skills and now having the diagnosis, yes. is, is there, you know, because in, in my case, through this process of feeling like, oh, you know, am I, am I unveiling a new person? And it's been interesting too, is that I've yeah. got two common reactions with when launching the podcast is that a lot of people are reaching out and saying, oh, my son or my brother, or I have ADHD and, and, you know, and so when I have a conversation there and then a lot of other friends saying, are you okay? Like as if, you know, there's going to be this drastic change, like, no, I'm the same person you've always known. It's just now I have a diagnosis and I have a better way of understanding myself. But in your case, in terms of where you're at right now, how's that go? Nobody's asked if I'm okay. I'm feeling neglected. Um, but I have spent quite a lot of time talking to friends about it and i struggled with identifying sorry i'm being more by carrot i struggled with identifying as someone who had masked so much for such a long time where i as an individual start and end and where the masking fits around that and that's been quite a difficult thing for me to work out and there's been a couple of changes. One, um, I think I am probably more direct than I was because I've stopped dressing it up as much. I don't feel the need to pretend. But also, and this is something that my friends and colleagues make fun of me about, I don't understand certain kinds of humor. It, it just, I've always, <laughs> when people have done it all my life and I've stopped doing that and just said, that's not funny. No, you know, I don't, well, it's not usually, so you're laughing. Everybody laughs when I say that's not funny. I don't understand why that's funny. But, you know, I've spent tens of years, decades, pretending that I understand what's going on. And actually sometimes, you know, people say things that I can't tell if they're being mean or funny. And, you know, one friend said to me, why would I ever say something that mean to you? You know, I really care about you. I love you. And I was like, yeah. I can't help it. It's just, and I feel that flicker of pain when those things are said to me. And I suspect lots and lots of neurodiverse people are the same. I and mean, we just don't understand it. You know, it's uh, a... In, in Good. So if Amanda ever laughs in front of you, she may not actually think it's funny. No, I don't think that's what she's going for here. I think once again, Amanda and I both and I have an ADHD diagnosis, but there are so many things that are different, all right? Because of so many different reasons, as you've seen, because of gender, because of where we grew up, because of the time of our lives uh, in which this happened, how all these things came about. I really think, though, and I can't stress enough, if you know anybody who has ADHD or if you do yourself, it's really important to just not jump to the, I would, and because I can't say anything about a neuro, somebody else's brain, I can only talk about mine, but I can say that sometimes I, it's, velocity over quality in the sense of the first thing that I think about is automatically jumping to a conclusion. And a lot of it is unpacking really the idea of what is a thought? A thought is not a fact, all right? A thought is just a thought. And a thought can be random. It can be uh, triggered by a lot of different things. But whether it's the emotional reactions, whether it's jumping to a conclusion, and particularly being hard on yourself of assuming, well, I must have done something wrong. So I'm bad and I'm terrible and I'm horrible and all these other things. That's a really difficult thing that I've been working on for some time now. And I think it can happen with other ADHD folks as well too because of being impulsive. And, and, and so like I said, those very, very quick sorts of reactions, but it really is different in, in, in every single case. That being said, we've got a few minutes left. I wanna open this up. Are there any questions? Are there any comments? Yes. That's a really good question, and I would say yes. Um, and I would say that th there were signs because of particularly the emotional dysregulations of my reactions to certain things that were just disproportionate of going from zero to not even 100, but 300. You could ask my parents, you could ask my siblings, you could ask my, my partner and say like, this happened and you did this. And then there are other situations where something actually bad could happen and my reaction is actually like really stable, which is interesting too because they, they talk about, you know, like jobs that people with ADHD like is where there can be high levels of like thriving in chaos. So like emergency medical technicians, soldiers, police officers, stuff like that. Or in my case, we're going to an event yesterday, two talks today, going to Amsterdam and coming back on Thursday for a meetup. So, um, and I don't know what else I probably have forgotten to mention there. Uh, so yeah, but I think that, 
I think that to your point that noticing those signs earlier on and and sort of trying to identify them, yeah, can also a neurotypical person overreact to something so you can't just take from one isolated incident that like, oh, this is what's gonna, how it's gonna be. Um, but that's how I would, that's how I would see it. Um, and like I said, everybody's case really is so different. So that, and that's why I've noticed with the podcast is like talking to people that will have really bad meltdowns um, and have to be isolated for days when something goes wrong and but they have to be open about this at work to saying like hey if this happens to me like i'm not going to be able to do stuff for a few days and and to be even to, to say that even out loud takes a lot because you're like i don't it's like we don't want special treatment we just want this to be very clear that like i may do this and just so you understand it's nothing personal this is how i've been in other cases does that answer your question okay cool yes Oh yeah, definitely. And, and I think I, uh, if I've maybe said a little bit earlier is that my entire life I've done well at school. I've done like pretty well in, in most things, but I've always felt like a total failure, like, or that, or that, and then also the comparison of looking at somebody else and thinking, oh, they're so much better, particularly, and I struggle with this a lot, which a lot, I think, I think there's a lot of imposter syndrome that goes on in many industries, but I think in, in, in perhaps in, in cloud native in general, I can say just being on that sort of side, um, salaries are good, jobs pay well, there are good conditions, so the feeling of I don't deserve this, um, there's no way that I can be that person. And in particular, in my case, coming into this world as a non-technical person, um, I've never written a line of code in my life, but this is what I do for a living um, in terms of being in this ecosystem. And so that was really hard. And so imposter syndrome is definitely something that I've struggled with. Um, but I would say more in this case because of being an outsider than in other ones where I maybe felt more comfortable. But being very hard on myself, absolutely. And so that even if something goes well, it's more like it's a relief that, oh, th th thank God it's over. It's not that like, oh, I actually did something good, you know? And another thing with that too actually is the people pleaser factor, right? I would say I suffer from this a lot more than Amanda does because Amanda can be like this and just walk away. <laughs> Good job, Amanda. Um, but for me, it's ending up creating these huge elements of extraction where I'm willing to give absolutely everything because of that imposter syndrome of feeling, well, I know I'm not that good, so I need to give all this away for free, otherwise they're not gonna like me or they're not gonna accept me. And so doing lots of favors and not taking care of myself and then realizing it while it's going on. So it's like, how can I stop that before it starts? So before I say yes to you know a project or a customer or things like that, how am I making sure that I'm taking care of myself by providing good boundaries? Because I've lived through enough horror stories that I should know and learn from that. It's the, it's the question is really learning from it and knowing when to you know, step on the brakes um, and, and just being conscious of that. So yeah, it's definitely something that's affected me. Yes. That's a great question. And the thing is, if your friends love you, they're not gonna judge you. They're not gonna care. And I've and it took me too long to realize that. And so now, it's not that I run to every single friend and say, oh, I'm feeling so embarrassed or things like that. But like, my friends that know me, they know really well that like, this is how I am. This is how I operate. I also, what's interesting too is that from a hereditary perspective, my dad is exactly the same, like exactly the same. And he's now, he's now said he was like, oh, well, if you have it, I definitely do too. What do I need to do? Um, and then we also realized that I mentioned as well too in this is that my grandfather was exactly the same. He got, he did, he got in the past in the US, they used to do like a psychological analysis for human resources processes. And he got weeded out of certain jobs because they're like, this guy is defiant. We can't put him at a desk. He's very creative and is good at, is very passionate about what he does if he's left alone. But yeah, but going back to your thing is that with my partner and also with good friends, I can just be really straight up and saying, I know this is probably just me, but I just need to get this out there. And then, so to get that sort of confirmation, just getting it out, sometimes even just writing it down to get a little bit of distance for me has been helpful. What I can say is not helpful is if I'm just chasing my tail in my head because I know exactly where that's going. Um, so if you, you know, you can have like a sort of code word of saying like, I'm having a Bart moment. And then it's like, okay. So now they know it's contextualized. 
And so if you can create a sort of code around that with someone that you trust, or even, you know, like I have different like chats with myself. Um, that sounds crazy. Um, the Joker 2 is coming out next year, folks, and Joaquin Phoenix is not playing. <laughs> um, no, but like for real, like just getting that little bit of external distance can help. Um, but I think a lot of it is just telling people like, hey, sometimes I just need to get something out there. And I'm not asking for a solution. That's another thing. It's like I'm not burdening you with the task of like having to like resolve this for me. But just being there, it's just being a good friend. And, know, and they know that you do the same for them. You know what I mean? Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes? Um, how do you like, assess whether uh, you could talk about you having ADHD to future employers or colleagues? Very good question. Depends on the company. You know, I mean, that's, that's my dodge that bullet answer. Like, but is there a criteria where you're like, okay, this is your off your... Yeah. That's a really good point, is, is knowing really clearly what's your job description, what's expected of you, who you're going to be working with. I did one of the interviews I did was with Jackie Grindrod, and shout out to her. She's amazing. And she works, at, she works at AWS, and they have an accommodations process where, like, they actually, like, give you, like, a coach or, like, a buddy system sort of thing inside the company. But every company's different, you know what I mean? So, like, I think more and more companies, particularly in this area, people say, oh, there are a lot of neurodiverse people in – in you know open source or cloud data that could be the case i think it's also just more open and i'm if it weren't for the fact i actually have to mention this i started exploring the possibility of being an adult with adhd because of listening to a podcast where someone named redbeard who's an absolute legend that i've never met in person was interviewed and talked about his process of getting diagnosed so in terms of bringing it up in a company because like i said and i would i strongly stated i'm not asking for a red carpet or that i have an unlimited blank check for excuses and things like that but saying that if X happens, I have a tendency to do Y. Um, and, and particularly around, so okay, strengths finding. What are the things that you do well and how can we have you focus on those? There will be times where you have to do things that you maybe not like so much. How do you build a reward system into that? You know, it's sort of like the carrot and the stick kind of thing. And that's another thing also with ADHD brains is like for every 30, 40 minutes of work, then you can go look at social media or do whatever stuff you wanna do because if not, I'm not going to show you my laptop right now, but I've got 500 tabs right open and <laughs> yeah, day and day, right? So yeah, um, and then I delete applications from my phone, and then I just spend all my time on the web app. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turns out you can still look at LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, <laughs> but um, but yeah, on the on the topic of the employer and coworkers, it really should be like a talent management HR kind of thing, um, and that you can say like. Uh, hey, how does your company um, approach the subject of working with folks that are neurodiverse? And, and see if there, if there are any, is there any blog posts, are there any tweets, are there any things that they've done about that? Are there other folks that work there? Oftentimes, you know, ones that are very visible that are in DevRel. Seems like a fair amount of folks in DevRel also are on the ADHD side of things are neuro, neurodiverse. But once again, it's a huge group of people, so you can't say it's all one thing or the other. So if you find some of those sort of champions that you know that are out there actively saying, hey, before I start working, I'd like to talk to so-and-so because I want to know about their experience. It shows your interest in getting to know the company better. You get to know the company better, and they get to know you better too. Um, so yeah, there's not, it's not one size fits all. I mean, I, one of the folks we did the panel with in, in Detroit, he was working in Saudi Arabia. And so talking about being neurodiverse in Saudi Arabia at a company there and talking about medication and psychiatrists, very complex thing to navigate. And, and like I said, in my case, it wasn't, it wasn't the same at all. Um, but I really think is don't suffer in silence, find a way to make it work for you. And, and really also just like everything else, there are communities of folks with ADHD that are happy to share their, their experiences. Um, and, and I just highly recommend it. And I realized that from doing the podcast and in typical ADHD fashion, recording like 13 episodes all at once, and then now it's like, I want to keep going with it. Why am I going to do the next one? Um, but, but yeah, there are really nice people that are out there who are happy to talk about it. So I think really take advantage of that. Um, yes, I think we're over time actually, but yes. Going back to the only to know, like the title, yeah. is the diagnosis worth it? Is the diagnosis worth it? Depending on what you do with it. In my case, definitely. Um, in my case, definitely, because it, it uh, allowed for a lot of healing and forgiveness and calm. Um, and then, and then, like I said, it added other factors, but like I expected results too quickly from the medication thing. That was a mistake. And realizing that it's not going to be, ah, ha, ha, everything's perfect. Like that's not it. So like, 
And and whether it's a diet or exercise or anything in life, nothing is ever just magically, you know, we always, there's no silver bullet, there's no this, there's no that. Well, it's the same thing. Um, so yeah, I would say the diagnosis was worth it, but it's much more than just, hey, here's a piece of paper that says you have ADHD. That's what I would say. It's much more than that. And whether you get a diagnosis or not, just a, you know, self-exploration, self-discovery, some people might even call it a spiritual journey. Um, I think it's one that's well worth doing. So yeah, Colleen, last question. Mm. And it's just wonderful if you want to uh, follow it. What is the experience from, I don't know, deeper introspection with the book uh, of just not getting the diagnosis, but trying to have a positive relationship with that book uh, or the book or the series um, uh, to do that with someone who owns a company that does that and has been you know, successful for that many years or something. But still, knowing that when you have something very severe that could happen to you, being warned that these are big moments for you. And it's a, I, I'm still learning that. Do you have any advice? Uh, that's a good question. D don't take it personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, really, like, don't take it personally. And that's hard, you know, and, like, massive shout-out to my partner, Maite, who's a wonderful person, because she has to deal with me on a, day to, on a regular basis. No, no, really, she, she is super cool, and I wish she could be here. But, um, but yeah, because uh, she has a beautiful heart and is a very kind, warm, gentle person, and then I lash out with these comments, and as the words are coming out of my mouth, <laughs> uh, and not just in the sense of, like, oh, I'm going to have to pay for that later. It's like, no, just a really stupid thing to say that you didn't actually want to say, just that you're, you value being quick more than anything else, and being quick doesn't mean, it doesn't, it just means being quick. That's it. Um, same thing with, you know, blurting out answers or stuff like that. So, yeah, it's really just about don't take it personally. With some folks, don't exp so unfortunately, with some, well, not unfortunately, with some people, because they don't even realize that it's a problem, won't apologize. And it, as a, and most of us, when someone does something that's kind of ugly, we're like, well, you know, you're going to say, yeah. Don't take it personally. It's a professional environment. Yes, <laughs> because the, what's the difference between the personal and the professional? We're all personal and professional, you know what I mean? Like. Yeah, I mean, as one minor thing, we, we do have to go because I literally have a plane to catch. I've never said that in my life. But no, but it doesn't matter because I like the pressure. Um, is <laughs> I got I got time. I mean, if the, if the AV people aren't kicking me out, I'm staying. Um, but no, is that is that for real? Like um, establishing some kind of a thing of saying, hey, you just had a you moment or something like that, just so that they're aware that you are continuing to try to do your job without major emotional interruptions. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really everyone, up to everyone to do that. Thank you all very much. You guys are great. You're amazing.